Good morning, everyone. Welcome to CEDA's live stream on empowering First Nations people, focus on employment. My name is Cassandra Windsor, and I'm Senior Economist at CEDA, the Committee for Economic Development of Australia. Increasing workforce participation is key to our con continued economic development, and improving employment outcomes for Indigenous Australians must be a priority. I look forward to hearing from today's panel of experts on the topic, and this event is the first in a series of CEDA events on empowering First Nations peoples, so look out for more later in the year. CEDA acknowledges that today and every day we're on Aboriginal land. Committed to recognition and reconciliation, we respect Elders and we support their stated aspirations. Today I'm coming to you from Perth, on the land of the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to the Elders past, present and emerging. The work that CEDA does is only possible through the incredible support of our members. To that end, I'd like to acknowledge the sponsors of today's live stream, BGIS and Indigenous Business Australia, and thank them for their ongoing support. I'll now hand, over, hand you over to Nakari Thorpe, Indigenous Communities Reporter at the ABC, to introduce our speakers and moderate today's discussion. Thanks, Nakari. Thanks so much, Cass, for the very warm welcome. It's a pleasure to be here with you all today. I'd like to welcome you all to CEDA's Empowering First Nations People's Focus on Employment Discussion, where our panel of experts will discuss how business can develop employment opportunities for First Nations peoples and provide culturally safe environments. As I mentioned, it's a pleasure to be with you all today to have this incredibly important discussion during what is a very uncertain time for us all. Um, but before we get underway, I too would like to acknowledge country and pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which I am on today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, to their elders past and present. So as uh, Cass mentioned, my name is Nakari Thorpe. I'm a very proud Gunai, Gunduchmara and Garangarang woman from Victoria and Queensland and um, an Indigenous communities reporter with ABC News in Sydney. So it's great to be with you all here today. And today, as at all CEDA events, you'll be able to interact with our speakers through the Q&A portal, which is available via the link uh, below the video on your screen, or you can enter in the details by going to cedar.pigeonhole.at and using the passcode employment. So please send any questions through that you may have during this conversation. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter by using today's hashtag, which is First Nations, and tagging cedar at cedar underscore news. Now I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to those joining us online and welcome those who are leading this important discussion today. So firstly, we have Shelley Cable, the Chief Executive Officer of Generation One, Mindaroo Foundation, Troy Cook, Director and General Manager of Community Engagement at the Rapunda Foundation, Ricky Cooper, Talent Acquisition Business Partner and Indigenous Engagement Specialist at BGIS, and last but not least, uh, Adam Davids, Director of Learning and Innovation at Career Trackers. Um, now, I'd just like to ask each panel member to introduce themselves and provide an opening statement before we get our panel discussion underway. So, Shelley, do you mind kicking things off for us today? Sure. Thank you so much, Nakari. I'd also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the country that I'm dialing in from today, which is Wajak Noongar country, and pay my respects to elders past and present. Nyang Kadich Nija Wajak Noongar Buja, Nyang Jeropin Nini Nija. Now, when we talk about employment, it's often easy to get carried away with economic analysis and numbers. So today I'd like to start by sharing a little story about my family. My Noongar family grew up in a small country town called Narajan. My grandfather, Barry, was one of 11 kids. And when my grandfather talks about his mum, he describes her as one of the hardest workers in Narajan. Now, in Narajan, similar to many other parts of Australia, being Noongar made getting a job very difficult. For my great-grandmother, 
what was exceptional was that she held down not just one job, not just two, but three. And she was a widow, effectively a single mum of 11. In the mornings, she'd roll newspapers. During the day, she worked in the mayor's office and by night, she cleaned the local hotel. Being employed allowed her to be self-sufficient and to support herself and her 11 kids. And moreover, it was a source of pride for my great-grandma. Her work ethic clearly rubbed off on my grandfather, who applied the same commitment to his football, unfortunately not to his schooling, and eventually got noticed and invited to play for Perth Football Club before several stints at North Melbourne, where he ultimately won two premierships, coached an AFL team, and made the AFL Hall of Fame. Now, while I'd like to think that my family is special and hard work is just a cable family trait, Honestly, it's not an unusual story. Hard work is an intrinsic part of Indigenous culture. Indigenous Australians are some of the hardest working people on the planet. In our culture, we have a history of full employment and everybody has a role to play. So why then do we have such a large Indigenous employment gap today and what can we do about it? This is the crux of our work at Generation One. Our mission is to create employment parity with and for Indigenous Australians in one generation. We estimate there's around 200,000 Indigenous Australians in work today. And to close the gap by 2040, we need another 300,000. In short, we are not on track. Our current pace sets us 200 years away from parity. And I don't think we should have to wait 200 years until any of us on this panel today have an equal chance of getting a job as anybody else in the country. And I'll be happy to share more about our work at Generation One later on the panel, but one part of the employment challenge I'd like to address now is the data gap. The data gap relating to Indigenous employment is horrific. Let me illustrate. Does anyone know how many Indigenous Australians lost their jobs during COVID? Does anyone know what's happened to the Indigenous employment rate over the past 12 months? Or to take it back to basics, does anyone know how many Indigenous Australians are in work in Australia? Now, the answer to all three questions is no. And I ask, how can you even begin to close the employment gap if you don't even know what it looks like? Indigenous Australians are invisible in our labour force and the last time that we had a comprehensive picture on the Indigenous labour force was in 2016. We know as business people that what gets measured gets managed and if we want to manage the employment gap, we need better information so that we can make better decisions and make smarter investments to close the gap faster than our current pace of 200 years away. Now, naturally, at Generation One, we're about finding solutions to not just problems. And one of the ways that we're looking to tackle this data gap is by producing Australia's first Indigenous Employment Index. Over the next 12 months, we'll be working with 50 of Australia's largest employers to establish a baseline of Indigenous employment at those organisations and test what works when it comes to sustainable and equitable Indigenous employment. This will be a critical evidence base for Australia from which we can all learn and begin to track our collective progress over time. We're going to fill the data gap one workplace at a time. So if your workplace has more than several thousand staff and you're interested in participating in our index, regardless of whether you're an expert or whether you're just starting your Indigenous employment journey, I welcome you to reach out. I look forward to your questions and our discussion over the next hour and I'll hand back to you, Nakari. Thank you so much, Shirley. Amazing to hear the work that you're doing and what you're so passionate about. So thank you. Now I'd like to hand over to Troy. Thanks, Nakari. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge where, where I'm streaming from over in uh, Wajak Nyungar Buja and, and, and respectfully pay uh, more respects to the, the elders past, present and, and emerging. Uh, I'm working at the Wirrapunda Foundation. I'm a director and, and uh, GM of community engagement. Uh, now, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about how the foundation you know, so was started and, and why we exist. We uh, you know, opened our doors back in 2005 and you know, we were three people strong then. 
Uh, and it was a bit of a focus on, on education, you know, with a bit of mentoring component attached to that. Uh, but over the, over the years, we, I mean, we developed uh, and evolved where, you know, the, the need was, and that was, you know, meaningful employment. And, and during that time, you know, we, we grown and, you know, involved and, you know, with the, you know, where we're based now over at Lathlane, we, we current, currently employ over 120 people, uh, which is an amazing effort. And, you know, our focus now is, has shifted from, you know, f- still employment, uh, still uh, education, but employment you know, in the justice system, but also business as well. But with this um, you know, theme, to, theme today, you know, our focus is on, on making sure that we, you know, do what we can as a foundation to make sure we can get as many Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people in, into uh, meaningful and full-time employment. So we've got a number of, of different uh, employment uh, programs that we that we offer at the foundation. And it's pretty important too that you know, we 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 are an open door policy you know uh, organisation, and we and we deal with many many different uh, people and, and their challenges uh, that, that they that they have. We never turn anyone away, and we try and work with them really close closely on how we can sort of address some of those challenges into employment. And with each of those programs, you know, is uh, you know, it's vital that we get the right people that are delivering, delivering those those programs. Uh, and we have a have a major focus on on our, our mentors being you know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, because that's where the biggest impact is. If they can have a connection, you know, to the person that they meet straight away, I think that helps build those relationships straight away. And then we can start, you know, honing in on on what uh, needs needs to to happen with with some of the challenges into work. And uh, on the flip side of that, also, you know, organisations who are looking to place Aboriginal people in the work, you know, we can, you know, we can hold, hold their hand through that sort of process and, and, and what, what is, you know, the best way that we can deal, you know, with that transitioning into employment once it happen, happens, you know, so whether it's, you know, you know, that cultural awareness component to it, you know, heavily mentoring focus as well. So it's a whole range of things that we, you know, we have embedded in each of those programs, you know, to make sure that we are, you know, you know, giving our our participants that we deal with every day, you know, uh, the, the best opportunity to to go into whatever employment that is, and and they're, that they're interested about, you know, it, you know, it will be as, as smooth as possible transition, but hopefully there for a, for a long period of time as well. So we've we've learned a lot along the way, um, and we'll continue to learn too, uh, and hopefully, you know, and and I encourage everyone listening, you know, today about you know, you, you actually can make a difference and and be a part of that. You know, the, you know, changing someone's life, and you know, and address some of those statistics that, unfortunately, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are, are high in, and and employment is, is one of those. So um, that's uh, I look forward to this uh, this discussion, and you know, hopefully, you'll hear more from me about uh, you know what some of those those challenges and barriers and enablers that uh, you now that the foundation does, and hopefully, we can share that through you know, everyone listening and also our, our other panelists as well. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Troy. Again, um, amazing to hear the work, incredible work that you're doing at the Wirrapunda Foundation. So thank you for that. Now I'd like to hand over to Ricky Cooper. Thanks, Nakari. Uh, I also would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land of which each of us meet today. For myself, I'm actually based up in Weber, which is up near uh, the Torres Strait Islands, um, and this is the Alma people land. Um, BGIS is a provider, uh, sorry, a leading provider in the facilities maintenance and real estate um, services globally. We manage over three, 30, sorry, 31 million square metres, um, and that can incorporate office spaces, universities, hospitals, schools, stadiums and data centres. Uh, I personally started with BGIS back in 2015 up here in Weeper as a contract manager for one of our local um, mining organisations, which was Rio Tinto. Um, following on from that, I was invited in and joined our Reconciliation Action Plan Steering Committee. Uh, from there, my role has evolved, so I've moved across now and in talent acquisition as well as being our, our National Indigenous Engagement Specialist also. So we've built our RAP. Um, we're working on our RAP. Um, I'm originally from southwestern New South Wales. I'm a very proud Nari Nari woman. Um, and for myself, uh, coming into BGIS, it was pretty much about how we can give back into our communities. How can we open up employment to our young people coming through? Uh, for anyone that, that knows me and speaks with me in relation to this, for me, it's more of a generational change. So we're not here to provide any quick fixes and to, to get people through programs quickly. We're about changing generations, um, which is very important, obviously, to our community. Um, as part of that and with BGIS, um, within our talent acquisition team, we have a diverse team ourselves. One of the things that um, 
moving into talent acquisition for myself was making sure that we know who our Indigenous employees are as a start and how would we collate that information and collect that information and then how would we build on and use that information, which has since uh, transitioned into, you know, mentoring programs for our own Indigenous employees being uh, buddied up with other Indigenous employees as well. Um, at the moment, we're, we've, you know, from 2015 through to now, we've seen a 1,600% increase in our um, engagement with our Indigenous communities and our Indigenous um, employees coming through. We work very closely with our partners, which is Quantaf and RL Schools to, uh, Schools to Work and um, the Career Trackers Program. Over the past two years, I think we've placed 19 career trackers within the business. And from there, it's about um, working with them to complete their university studies. And we've also offered employment to some of the students at the end of their qualification as well. So it's that journey between education through to employment that we like to focus on. One of my proud um, achievements with BGIS and, and people ask where does it come from and why did we decide to do it is we actually have our own Indigenous artwork um, for the business that actually tells our journey from where we started in Australia many year, years ago through to where we are today and where we want to take it in the future. So for an Indigenous person now walking into our organisation, seeing that artwork, um, you know, some of the feedback that we've received is it actually shows that as an organisation we are you know, open to and we are encouraging and it's a it's a safe place for our Indigenous employees, our clients and, our, you know, people walking through the door. Um, as well. So I guess our next uh, step through our programs is we, you know, we, we've always focused on in, internships, apprenticeships and traineeships where we've seen some fantastic results. However, our next step is now working and attracting our mature and our skilled workforce. So that will be um, our next goal um, and how we can better encourage and increase employment opportunities in that area. Thanks, Nakari. Thank you so much, Ricky. Again, yeah, incredible work you're doing up there. So thank you so much. Um, and last but not least, um, Adam Davids. Thanks. Thanks so much, Nakari. And, and like yourself, I'm sitting on uh, the country of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, my name's Adam. I'm a proud Aboriginal man um, of Wiradjuri descent in central New South Wales. And I grew up between southwest Sydney and Campbelltown uh, and a country town known as Wagga. Um, growing up, you know, excellence really was defined in the sports arena, particularly in communities where I was raised. That never really was it about further edu you know, higher education and professional employment. Um, and working in career trackers has opened my eyes up, particularly into just how important um, this is, which I'll address um, in, in just a moment. Um, but what I thought I'd talk about here is the origins of, of where career trackers came from, the historical context, and particularly uh, my focus around professional employment. And I'd, I'd also like to thank Cedar for the invitation to join and participate in the dialogue. Um, professional employment is, is where the career trackers program operates in. And when I reflect on the importance of this um, aspect of employment, I think back to the roots in which career trackers was derived um, the Career Trackers organization was born out of a nonprofit in America called Inroads. Um, and this organization was founded in 1970, at the end of the civil rights era that we know in the 1960s. It was literally inspired by the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. Um, and we now know that the Inroads organization ha has been recognized as a pioneer uh, at a time when diversity and inclusion weren't even really a, a, an expression that was used. Um, as such, but pioneered an internship model um, that we know and, and cherish today. Uh, the impact of the Inroads internship program for African Americans, Native Americans, and Hispanic Americans over a 50 year period has seen some of the most prominent minority executive leaders um, that, that lead in industry. That includes people like Tassanda Duckett, who was the CEO of uh, JP Morgan and Chase's retail business. Uh, she's now the CEO of TIAA which is a Fortune 500 company. Um, and there's so many more incredible individuals that emerged from this program. And I think that this is such an important context because the vision of what Career Trackers um, is trying to unlock is a future where we have representation uh, in leadership in, in, in industry, in the private sector, where we've been largest, largely um, 
uh, not involved um, in, in around the decision-making tables. And, and the Inroads program really was the catalyst because the, the founder of Career Trackers actually was a participant of that organization. So what is Career Trackers today? We started in 2009 for a nonprofit organization that creates internship opportunities for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander university students with a vision to usher in the next generation of our people into leadership. Uh, and we do that by visiting university campuses around the country, spending time with students to learn more about them and their career passion, which for many, they may be the first in their families to study at university still. They may be the first in their families to have worked in a professional job and in the private sector. And so we'll train them and prepare them, provide them with ongoing leadership development year round, equip them with a, a full-time staff member of our organization that supports them year round during the academic term, uh, and then pair them up with a sponsoring organization like BGIS, where Ricky um, works uh, to structure a, a, an internship. We don't, we're not a job agency. We don't fill existing jobs per se, but rather work with our partners and students to map out a career pathway where they can come in and do paid internships every summer holidays of their university degree, such that when they graduate, they have the skills, the tools and the networks to enter into full-time employment when they finish we know that there is a disproportionate rate that our people are participating in professional jobs. Uh, CAPERS report um, suggests that um, Indigenous Australians are around half as likely to work in professional jobs and managerial jobs. So it's right up right in our remit to change that in the long term. We also know that in higher education, Indigenous students are dropping out of university and statistically approximately only four of out of every 10 Indigenous students that start a degree will finish. So as much as our bigger vision is to bring in the next generation of Indigenous leaders in industry, it's also about building the survival skills of our students to complete their studies and enter into professional employment. Thanks again, Makari, for that. All right. Thank you so much, Adam. That was great. And to the rest of our panel, um, it's really great to hear of the incredible work that you're all doing around the country in what is a really important um, sector to be working with. So thank you so much. It's great to hear what you're doing. Um, now, we'd like to get this panel discussion underway. And firstly, I'd just like to remind everyone watching our audience to ask any questions they may have and we'll ask them during this conversation. So this will be quite a fluid conversation. Um, and so please send them through and we'll ask them for you, which you can do via the Q&A portal below your screen or by entering in the details by going to cedar.pigeonhole.at and using the passcode employment. So I just wanted to kick things off um, and throw this to all of you. Um, I guess what are some of the success stories in enabling Indigenous participation and why did these particular projects or programs work and can that is that something that can be applied more broadly? I'm not sure who wants to kick it off. Troy, maybe you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I'm happy to, yeah. I mean, we're pretty lucky at the foundation, you know, we... You know, we can engage with a lot of different you know, organisations. And to, just to give you one example, um, uh, we we had uh, about 10, uh, 10 men and women uh, actually engage uh, through a uh, mindsight servicing company. And they actually, you know, went and had a site visit of where they were going to be training, do the training. It was about a 10-day, a bit of a, just under two-week course. And then uh, as it, once they actually finished their training, they actually, you know, with a couple of other mining companies' help, uh, actually did a, a site visit. So he flew them up to site, showed them mine life site, you know, where they're going to live, uh, eat, and then actually took them out to the asset where they're going to work. And it was a whole day's experience. And, you know, it was amazing you know, to get a bit of a you know, hands-on feel about what they were going to go into. Uh, and then once they actually flew back home, um, each, each and every one of them actually got given, you know, a job, right, as, as they just about left the airport. So it was, it was amazing for each of those organisations to, to, one, kick in for – you know, the training, pay for the training, pay for their PPE, uh, you know, flights up to the site and really invest in, you know, you know in, in, some, in all of those participants. You know, it, it, was, it was great to see and, you know, to see the look on their faces where, you know, they go into this workforce where, you know, 
it's just, it's just changed their lives. And, and on the flip side of that, you know, we've had a couple of people come back into our employment programs and actually talk on their stories as well and their experiences in the full-time work that they've been, been there for you know, ever since. You know, so it's amazing, and it's a you know entry into that, that you know into the industry. I know WA is we're lucky to be in the, the area where we are with that you know the mining industry. But that's just one story where you know investing in a bit of training, you know, helping out where they can. You know, each of those companies are really serious about you know, you know putting in their own pockets to, to actually train, and then uh, you know given that experience, what, what's needed to to make sure that they are uh, that transition as smooth as possible into the employment. And if I could just jump on on the back of that, I completely agree with what Troy is saying. And it's quite interesting to me that often employers who do a good job around Indigenous employment are ones who aren't just trying to get numbers. They're not trying to hit a one, two or three percent target. That's obviously part of their strategy, but often it's employers who actually invest in the work readiness of individuals, people who are and organizations who are ready to support those Indigenous staff, you know, across into different roles within their organization, up the ranks and into managerial positions. So um, one of the things that we're looking at through our Indigenous Employment Index is what a comprehensive view of good Indigenous employment actually looks like. And quite often I find that Indigenous that employers are so focused on a target and 3.3% or whatever they've set for themselves, that often they forget that you also need to have organisational um, and workplace leadership and commitment. You also need to have a cultural safe, a culturally safe uh, workplace for people to come into. There's no point getting people in the door if they leave next week because it's not a great experience for them. And, again, you can also support Indigenous employment by supporting Indigenous businesses as well and procurement and directing your spend, your procurement spend, towards Indigenous business. So to answer your question, Nakari, I think it's more than just about um, hitting numbers and making it your own organisation look great on the face of it. It's also the ones that work are the ones that really do invest deeply in their staff. And something that I'd like to add there as well, um, and I'm totally agreeing on what you're, you're saying, it's very relationship driven. So as part of the, the mentoring program um, that we have from with our Indigenous employees and our interns and our um, trainees that are commencing is what to expect when you're actually coming to work. So as a mentor with my Indigenous um, colleagues, I don't speak to them about their roles or their targets or what their expectation is in their day-to-day job. I speak to them about home environments and what they need to do each day to be prepared for work whilst at home and then once you actually arrive at work. So it's that relationship piece as well that that continues through. So from the programs through to us. and, And I had a conversation with one of our trainees and, you know, she's got five mentors across career trackers, ourselves. So all these different areas and streams that, that organisations and employees can tap into as well. And um, just coming back to your question, Nakari, around success stories, I talked about before, For you know, there is a stark picture as it relates to Indigenous students studying at universities. You know, we aren't seeing, we're seeing loads of students sign up and commence studies, but we're also seeing loads of students drop out and, and, and end their degrees early, um, approximately four out of 10 I mentioned. And what we're seeing in our program is, is that nearly nine out of every 10 students that complete internships are finishing their studies. And, and I could name many of the things that we do deliberately to, to sort of support the students. But, but I think about one of the really important factors that should be in this conversation is around genuine leadership. From, from the private sector and, and the conviction that's required from even CEOs to get behind this stuff. I, I'll never forget the day sitting at our gala dinner event about five years ago when we awarded our intern of the year award to a student who was interning at Qantas. And we asked Alan Joyce if he wouldn't mind presenting the award on stage in front of the audience. And so Alan gets up, you know, unscripted and you couldn't have scripted what he'd, he'd said it any better but he gets on stage and he says if a gay irish man can be the ceo of Qantas, then an aboriginal woman's got no problem you know and you know you might think about that in a lot of different ways but i just think about how important of a message that is for the student interns working at Qantas to see their leader on the stage talking in such a way with the belief that these students absolutely can be the future executives of the business um, and to hear that from the top uh, with conviction and belief and through the sponsorship uh, that filters throughout the organisation uh, has to be uh, the end consequence of that as well. 
Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you so much, Adam. Thank you all for that. Um, definitely, I remember that moment when Alan Joyce got up and, and spoke about that. It was definitely something that stuck in a lot of people's memories, I think. So thank you all for that. Um, this question is from our audience and it probably flows into what we're talking about and it may be a little bit repeat, repetitive, but we'll go into it. It's from Alana. So she's asking what case study examples are there for successful First Nations, targeted First Nations employment programs for growing and emerging industries? So another question to, to all of you. I might just build on some of the things that I mentioned before. And we've done some social and economic impact studies on our program. I think this is a really important question of accountability to nonprofits that work with our, our mob. Um, it's something that I encourage all organizations to really do in depth. And I think that, um, you know, further studies and, um, uh, can, you know, should be done. It's an important question because it's like, how do you, you know, what are the, the features that you're looking for in terms of impact, what are we looking for? Are we looking for the number of people in the workplace? Are we looking for the income trajectory that they're on? Um, one of the big um, parts of this equation that I'm really passionate about, which was an end result of my Fulbright exchange in the US, where I looked at similar you know, minded employment programs for minorities, is to ask that same question is, how do you measure impact and what does impact in the long term look like? Not just in a couple of years, but in 50 years. If we do this work successfully over 50 years, what, what is the trajectory and, and how does it meet the interests of, of the community? And the economic goals of our mob, I think, have got to be uh, you know, really identified in a couple of key areas. One of those is in wealth right? It, it, income is fantastic. If we can get our people onto higher levels of income, and we know that the, the research tells us that Indigenous Australians earn 66 cents to every dollar earned by other households um, by way of difference. But what about the intergenerational aspect? You know, Ricky mentioned the intergenerational thought process that has to be applied to this work. Um, and income is fantastic, but what about home ownership? What about the level of wealth attainment um, that you could pass on to the next generation. You know, these are, you know, again, questions that I don't think have really been asked all that much, certainly from a data standpoint, um, taking to, to, to Shelley's point that there's a lot of data that just doesn't exist that you can't get your hands on. You know, what is the, the level of wealth of Indigenous Australians household comparing to a non-Indigenous household? I think that there's, that's a big question mark. We don't actually know the answer to that. Um, the model that we're leading in an internship program uh, we studied this question as to the long-term uh, impact of it. And, and the impact was that uh, alumni of this model in the US uh, have greater levels of wealth and home ownership. 76%, in fact, of Inuraj alumni are in their own home, comparing to 41% of the black population in the US. So I think that's a really important question. And, and certainly from a career tracker standpoint, we should be held accountable uh, to continuing that study and impact. Yeah, great. Thanks, Adam. Um, and our, our next question uh, ties into that as well about data. So it's for you, Shelley. It's from Ulrich Adam. Hopefully I've pronounced that correctly. Thank you for your question. Um, it is about how do we unlock the data question, which seems to be an Australian issue in reference to vaccination data. And what role can businesses play in that area? Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Dakari, and thank you, Ulrich, for your question. I think it's, it's the data question is so interesting because it, it, we know what the most popular baby names were for 2020. You know, we know how many Krispy Kreme donuts get sold on any day. Like, we, we don't have a problem with data. We actually often have kind of the wrong types of data, in my opinion. We also know how many Indigenous Australians are incarcerated and in jail every night. So, for me, the, the reason I, I don't understand why we don't have Indigenous employment data as as well, I'm not quite sure why we've got data around baby names, but not actual you know, labour force participation. So for me, I think it's a problem that absolutely needs to be solved and it will help us to close the employment gap faster than 200 years away from now. So from my perspective, there's probably two ways that you can go about this data challenge. One of them is top down to so looking at national level solutions, most likely led by government, probably the ABS, to figure out what data sources exist already that we can actually actually combine or integrate, you know, 
giving light of sight, of course, to privacy concerns and a whole range of other barriers that exist. Um, but there has to be a national level solution. It could also look like the Workplace Gender Equality Agency expanding its remit to not only capture gender data, but actual diversity and, and cultural diversity data as well, knowing that thousands of employers actually complete that every single year. They're already popping their lids and popping the hoods on their own workforce data. So to try and capture Indigenous employment data might be um, a relatively straightforward way to go about that. So you've got the top down. The other way around it is to find bottom up. So workplace by workplace, actually closing the data gap one employer at a time. So a lot of employers, it was uh, really interesting to see the, the poll result, which I, I don't want to give away too soon. But the number of people who don't feel comfortable asking their staff whether or not they're Indigenous, uh, that is a data gap very much so in your own organisation. And I completely understand the sensitivities around it. And you can't just point blank, come out and ask it. It's, it's got to be part of a, a broader strategy messaging as to why you're asking for that information and, and what you'll do with it. But for me, if we can't actually close the employment data gap one workplace at a time, we're not going to be able to close it at a national level either. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Shelley. Um, we have another question from Chris. Uh, thank you, Chris. It's, again, to everybody. Um, it's about um, considerations for businesses when employing Indigenous Australians around language, specific inclusion, exclusive uh, practices. Are there any considerations for businesses? I think that falls under the cultural awareness um, training module. So I, a business is across Australia. It should just be part of their mandatory training. Um, obviously, our nations within the Indigenous space, um, there's, there's 200 of, you know, of us across the country. But, but building something that's uniform and, and opening up that conversation piece and something that Shelley said earlier about just asking the question of your Indigenous employees, um, which is something that we now do. We, we, we didn't do that in the past. And general feedback was how do you even ask that question? And, and how I educated back into to BJS is think of every form within Australia that you complete. It does actually ask that question. Um, so as part of um, our recruitment strategy and when we are um, engaging or, or making verbal offers, it is just part of our standard questions. And it's as simple as, yep, I've got your resume attached. What's your date of birth? date of birth, do you identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander? I personally then keep that data. So we, you know, within um, our reconciliation committee, we then make contact with them, seeing whether they're wanting to join to give them a voice. Some people choose not to because, you know, it's sometimes it can be a shame job or, you know, organisations that they've worked for in the past haven't, um, you know, given them the voice where we, we, we contact those employees. So we, we go out of our way to make contact and say, this is who we are. This is what we do. Would you like to join in, in the committee? Do you want a seat at the table? This is your chance to now take our organisation, you know, and our, our roadmap for the next five years because it can't just be one, two or three people within the organisation doing it. It has to be part of the DNA. Yeah, I agree with that, Ricky. I mean, I think it is you know, you know, very important to make sure that you know, the businesses are uh, doing the back background work. And, and like I said, you know, I know from you know, what we do at the foundation, you know, having that opportunity to, you know, to, to meet with with different organisations, and they, you know, they, they're really serious about you know having Aboriginal people in, into their workforce. But you know, are the, uh, is it a bit of culturally safe? I suppose, and 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 you know, what's you know what you know what what sort of embedded in their in their business, and you know. Definitely, cultural awareness training, you know, is a key. But actually, you know, uh, having, you know, if they are identifying, you know, a certain sort of participant, we would actually get them to go out to their workplace and, you know, uh, just have a bit of a look and 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 meet the people as well. But it is really important to make sure that, uh, you know, it, it's it's you know, um, led from the top down as well, and making sure you know the you know the execs have, uh, are really serious about it, and uh, you know, having those sort of systems. Um, uh, in place for you know you know for, for anyone to you know to come into their organisation, so it is uh, you know very important. I do agree with what you said, Ricky. Might also yeah, comment yep. um, in like breaking it down to like the managerial level. I'm thinking that maybe that that's the context where the question may have come from. And, and cultural awareness, absolutely, yeah, from the from from the top down all the way through it. But also in addition to that, I think some common sense as well. And you know, I remember a student of ours 
working in their internship in a business where they were like late to work a bunch of times and it was happening more and more often. And the manager was afraid to talk to the Aboriginal uh, and, and pull them up on it. No, I don't want to upset them. Don't want to offend them or what have you. But then as it, as it continued to happen, um, the inclination was more like this person is just not going to work out working in this business. They don't respect the time. They don't respect the etiquette and they don't have, um, they're not letting us know. But the truth of the reality was that this particular student, the older sibling in their family, and before coming to work every day, they'd walk all the kids to work, all, all the other kids to school before going to work. And so carrying that responsibility, sure, may have a cultural lens to it, but it also has a common sense lens to it. If you just have the discussion like a person and understand what responsibilities it is that they're carrying, that might alleviate these types of issues from getting out of hand. Um, and so I think a common sense approach is another one. And, and the only other thing that I would say in addition to this uh, is, uh, you know, progressing a bit further on into, you know, those Indigenous uh, professionals and, and skilled professionals uh, working in business, making sure that they're getting uh, equitable projects to work on, right? Like you don't want to just sort of throw all the big, challenging, opportunistic projects to uh, staff that you might see as being more competent because they fit a certain mould. But it, uh, we've got so many professionals out there working at the moment that they also need to be invested in further developed and offered the same opportunities to work on challenging projects, massive legacy projects. Some of our, the career trackers alumni are working in everything from cyber security at Apple's headquarters in San Francisco to having helped build Barangaroo and Wynyard Walk as engineers. Um, and they're just incredible assets that industry should be taking advantage of, but making sure that there's a good set of opportunities for them to work on uh, as part of their career development is what I would recommend. Also on that as well, on the cultural piece as well. So the question was, are there any considerations for business when employing Indigenous Australians? And something um, and that, that I often get asked the question, even external to, to BGIS, is how many grandfathers can one person have? This person wants to take, you know, four days off a year because four of their grandfathers or five of their grandfathers. And it's that family structure as well. So you have to understand in that cultural piece that, you um, where you you know your birthplace within your family then brings along you know certain things within your your family that when it comes to a sorry business that you actually have to attend so if someone you know is bringing you my grandfather passed away and you know I've had a, a, a boss say well didn't their grandfather pass away last week and to actually then explain it may not be the person that birthed them or, or the you know parental it could be the person that raised them or their uncle that is then classed as as their grandparent or father as well so it's that conversation piece and you know if you do have indigenous employees within your business opening up those questions with them and, and how asking them how would you ask this question in a safe space like how how would I ask this question to make you feel comfortable in answering it and that can then open that up to the wider business as well Yeah, great. Thank you, guys. That's some really important points that were raised there. Um, and I guess more specifically, this is another question from Chris and ties in with another question. Um, what should business, businesses do, specific actions to attract Indigenous Australians into the workforce? And what are some of the best ways to engage current First Nations employees to have that conversation and have a seat at the table? So there's two there. I think for us, um, like I spoke about earlier, was our Indigenous artwork and our Indigenous branding within our own BJS brand. Um, following on from that with, with our talent acquisition team, we've created, um, you know, videos that we now put as part of our um, advertising that is um, Indigenous focused. So, And then having Indigenous leaders within the business. And it's all, again, about those relationships. So if you could go out and, you know, spend a day at a college and having a chat to the students, it's a lot of that relationship and, and being an organisation with your artwork where if you've got Indigenous uniforms, it shows that as a business you are open to welcome, welcoming on all levels Indigenous employees. 
I think uh, Ricky makes a really good point. Like it really does start with relationships. So if you already have Indigenous staff in your business, for example, how can you get them to be more external or community facing in order to, I guess, share a bit about the culture of your organisation and and really position it as hopefully a a culturally safe place to work and a a great place to come to work if you want to advance your career as an Indigenous Australian. I find that often Indigenous employment has a snowball effect. So if you hire one or if you can ideally get to more than one, so two or three, um, they often have connections or relatives or their relationships that they can bring into the business as well. So I find once you hit a tipping point, it actually becomes a lot easier. So it's often the first step and getting the flywheel turning is actually the hardest part. And I think following on from what a lot of us have said um, earlier is making sure it is a genuine you know, you are wanting employees. It's not just I have to get it because, I, you know, there's a 3% target that we want to reach of Indigenous employment. So I think Indigenous people can really see from a mile away whether a, a business is committed and it is part of their DNA and it is something that they want to improve on. And then you can also see the people that are just doing it, which has been said to me, you know, in previous years, just to tick the box to say that they are doing you know, because they've put it as part of their action plans or so on and so forth. So that's very important is if you're going to do it, genuinely do it, you know, from the heart, from the relationship side, rather than just saying, oh, we're just going to slap this up and we're just going to do it. Whereas that relationship and the the long, long goals as well. So you never, you never want to work on an, a quick fix in the next three months. This is what I want to do. Again, it's that generational change. It's the slow change as well, which then shows it becomes as I said, part of your DNA becomes part of what your business does on a daily basis, and then you just continually grow from that. Yeah. And, and just and just following on from that, I think a lot of businesses have the right intentions to actually you know, employ Aboriginal people and, and get involved in that procurement space as well. But we've found that some people, they don't know where to look and where, and where to go. And and so, you know, hopefully this will, will encourage everyone to, to reach out and, and, and you know, find where they can get the help from um you know just just my own experience is you know trying to uh as part of my role for trying to find out where the next opportunity for for you now for the foundation is is and you know trying to guide uh businesses who whether they have a reconciliation action plan or, or not and you know they have some targets in there to, to, to place Aboriginal people into their workforce they just don't know where to go um and and how to go about doing it so yeah, if you are seriously better, you know, reach out to these organisations who who have a heap of uh, you now participants who, who are willing to work. Um, you know, invest and in, in back in some you know, some training if there is needed. You know, get all the pre- you know, prerequisites that's required and and see if you are uh, yeah, see if you can help. You know, uh, you know, and, and and I think one of the other important things is too, if you are seriously about it, try and quarantine a couple of roles for you know for you know particularly for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Then you know that is you know, showing that you are serious about it and, you know, do whatever you can to, you know, whether it is training, you know, um, you know, see where the help can needed, um, you know, cultural awareness training, anything like that. I think, uh, yeah, to, to reach out and, and, and trying to find those organisations where, yeah, there, there are a lot of job seekers out there. I think it's, um, you know, a really good start to, to make sure you can, you know, increase those numbers and, and, and making sure you're doing it for the right reasons as well. I think really what Ricky and Troy are bringing up here is that there's there's literally hundreds of things that organisations can do to start on their Indigenous employment journey. Often it comes down to relationships. You know, if you're going to undertake cultural awareness training, for example, that would necessarily involve connecting with traditional owners to do that training for you. If you're not sure, groups like Rear Funder Foundation, groups like Career Trackers uh, uh, can actually help. So if you're not quite sure where to turn, organisations like this who already have community connections, they have a pipeline of job seekers can often make it easier or you know to to talk about Ricky you know you can employ an amazing Indigenous Australian in your business to help you with that you don't have to do it by yourself you shouldn't have to do it by yourself. I was going to say that one I believe one of the most vital ways for an employer to improve their brand in the Indigenous community as an employer of choice is about a meaningful experience a meaningful opportunity one of the things that we do in career trackers, which is just ingrained in the way in which we deliver the program, uh, is that every single student is required to have a learning contract that's agreed between career trackers, the manager and the student to make sure that the students aren't just running coffees, right? They're not just doing photocopying, that they're actually involving themselves in real projects. One of our interns helped to redesign the flight path of the A380s at Qantas, for example, like 
the, the more meaningful the experience, the better the, the taste that the student is going to have in the opportunity. And the Koori grapevine runs really quickly. Students talk to each other. Um, they talk to each other. They will talk about their experience in the business, whether good or whether it's bad, and that will have an influence on the brand of an employer. The only other thing that I would say is to be very open-minded with the manner in which you take in uh, employees and in particular in our program students. Um, sometimes companies can have a very fixed way in, in how they recruit undergraduates um, as, as in internships. Take, for example, in the legal industry, um, you know, they usually take on clerks in their penultimate year of, of, of legal studies, which as per the, the data I mentioned before, given the fact that Indigenous students aren't likely to see it all the way through to the end of their degree, statistically speaking, um, if we wait until penultimate year, you're not going to have Indigenous students to employ. Uh, and so we've got to be prepared to take students right from their first year of studies in a diversity of areas. So if a student studying social work, it doesn't always mean that they want to be a social worker. It might actually mean it's because their high school career counsellor said, just start a social work degree to get you going. But actually, there's a whole other career set of objectives that they have that businesses can, uh, if, if you know, they approach it with the right mindset um, and, and look at these students as talented uh, and having potential to be long-term effective employees in the business. And that's a very different lens that I think ought to be applied. Yeah, great. Thank you guys so much. I think we may have time for one more question and it probably ties in um, again with this the, the last question, the conversation we were just having, and it's from Dom. He's asking from a policy perspective, is there a consensus on how to promote Indigenous employment? And is a different approach required in comparison to the non-Indigenous populations? It's kind of a question to all of you again. I can jump in first, but I'd love to throw to Troy, just knowing that the Wirupanda Foundation do operate very much in this policy space. Um, but for me, my observations are that the majority of Indigenous Australians that are employed don't go through specific Indigenous employment training programs or employment programs. The vast majority go through the mainstream employment services sector. Um, and as, as one example of demonstrating that, the VTEC program, which Generation One and, and Fortescue Metals Group had a strong role in developing, um, that's put around 10,000 Indigenous Australians into work uh, and that's been one of the biggest uh, programs and biggest numbers seen through an Indigenous employment program or, or service, employment service. Uh, you compare that to the 200,000 mob that are in work today, we think, um, and clearly it's it's quite a small number. So I think you can't, uh, you can't just take one side of it. You can't just look at mainstream employment services and, and do that. You've also got to be able to offer specific Indigenous employment services. And from my perspective, uh, I don't think that business and industry's needs have been considered enough when we're looking at Indigenous employment services, and I'm talking sort of publicly funded services. Um, often Indigenous, uh, sorry, often employers will need to go through their own channels, for example, hiring someone like Ricky to actually help them with that. There's, there's often not a strong connection into a VTEC or a job active provider, for example. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Ellie. I mean, we yeah, we are a, a VTEC at the foundation, and you know we've had some great results over the years. And you know, obviously, we're we're supported by the federal government in delivering you know, those outcomes. And you know, we've had a significant change, you know, especially our you know retention rates, uh, you know, to to our participants, and and it's right all on the back of of our you know upping our mentoring um, contacts. You know, and making sure that the, that communication to our to our participants, transitioning into into into, into employment, and, and working really closely with their employees as well to to making sure that you know it is a smooth transition in there. And uh, you know, like I said it's it, it's massive. And, and I'd probably like to touch on one of the other programs that we do run, and we're lucky enough to get some um, and some some corporate funding for, for this. And this is our fit for work program. And there's no sort of red tape behind it. We can be pretty creative in what we on what we do and how we engage with our with our participants. So you know, it's 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 a a program where we invite uh, people to, to to our to our to our offices looking for work. Um, they have to be linked with a job active, uh, or even not, then we can sort of help them get on that track to you know to to work with, with us as well. Uh, but it's just like a you know, word of mouth, um, you know, family connections, and uh, and we're really community focused where. You know, they're not intimidated when they come to us, um, 
they're, they're in a safe place. Uh, but we can like, we can do what we want. And the way we go about it at this stage is, is we invite organisations down who are serious about placing Aboriginal people into their workforce. They come into our, our offices. They, say, they stand in front of our participants, explain where, what their company does and what they do and where the, where the real um, impact is. They actually do offer and we encourage them to offer a real job at the end of it. So with our, our participants, you know, if they're in the room, you know, they can take some notes as well. Uh, the people, the, that company will stay behind, uh, answer any questions they, they like and, and uh, yeah, make, you know, making sure that, that you know, that organisation, whoever we get in there, you know, are really serious about um, engaging with, with, with our participants or on a person who's, who's looking for work. And, and on the flip side of that, you know, we can, we can help once they, once they leave and help that participant if they are interested in that job you know, seeing what the next, uh, what the next steps are, what the challenges are, you know, do they need driver's license? Hopefully they don't, um, no police clearances, all those, all those barriers that, you know, unfortunately, you know, the, the, some of the, the, the people that we deal with you know, are, are real. And, uh, you know, if we can, you know, uh, help, help with that, uh, you know, those issues initially, you know, then you know, it is pretty important. So, but it's, 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 it's more of a sort of curated way where we can, We've got no sort of no red tape. There's no barriers there. You know, no one telling us, oh, we can't do this, can't do that. But we, you know, we, we do it anyway. And with the whole focus is, is, is placing you know, our participants in the work and, you know, dealing with their, you know, some of the challenges that, that, that'll, that'll hold them back. Thank you so much, Troy. And um, to all of our panel, we have run out of time. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get to all of the questions, but thank you so much for sending them all in. And I would like to thank our participants today, Shelley Cable, Troy Cook, Ricky Cooper and Adam Davids for sharing your expertise and your insights. It's been a really robust conversation and um, no doubt something we need to continue having. And finally, I would like to thank the audience for their time and for your participation in this discussion as well. And just remind you all that this discussion has been recorded and will soon be available on the CEDA website for you to watch and share with your colleagues and network. But before we let you go, we just wanted to uh, share with you the poll results which you all participated in. So you were asked about five to six questions and I'm just going to share the results with you now. So firstly, you were asked if your organisation has programs to attract and support Indigenous employees. So there was, the result was 22%. The second question was, I am confident to ask new starters if they, if they identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. 16% was the result. Thirdly, my organisation has a mentoring program for Indigenous employees with Indigenous employees, and the results of that was 9%. Then my organisation has a reconciliation action plan, and that result was 28%. The fifth question was, my organisation has a social procurement program which engages with Indigenous businesses, and that result was 19%. And none of the above, the last question, was at 5%. So some very interesting uh, results there, no doubt um, important that we have this conversation. So thank you all so much for participating. And um, now we'd like to... Uh, wrap up there so you can keep up to date on what Seed is doing in their program by visiting cedar.com.au and you can register for the following upcoming events which is on the 13th of July they'll have a live stream of the South Australian State of the State Address by the Premier Stephen Marshall and also the following day on the 14th is Towards Net Zero feature new AEMO CEO Daniel Westerman um, but please continue this conversation we didn't get to all of your questions so please continue this um, by connecting with CEDA via LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube and Facebook. So thank you all so much again for your time and to our amazing panel for their insights and I hope you all have a great rest of your day and stay safe. <laughs>